Hello. <laughs> We're inside today. Yay! Y'all, it's cold outside. And for me, right now is the perfect time to be thinking about my dream garden. So let me tell you how I do that. It'll be great. <laughs> I think I say that in every video. It's gonna be fun. I say convincingly. Come along. Oh, hi. My friend's like. We're inside today. Um, because a lot of good gardens start inside, friends. No, it's just really cold out there and I don't have anything I need to do. And the house is pretty quiet right now. So I am jonesing to start daydreaming about my garden. Now I garden in zone 6B. No, scratch that. They've changed the hardiness zones, y'all. If you haven't checked that out due to climate change, I am now officially in zone seven. What in the world? But we are in the depth of winter. One of the loveliest things to do in the depth of winter is to start dreaming about your garden. So that's what I want to talk about today is how to daydream productively right now in my zone. It is neither too early nor too late to do this. I actually think my timing is pretty daggone perfect in just a week or two. I am going to be starting to sow some of my earliest seeds. I have already actually sown, um, done some winter sowing as kind of bonus seeding, but, but none of that is a have to. This is perfectly appropriate timing to start really thinking about how I'm going to lay out my garden. Now, when it comes to planning a garden, there are two things that really need to be considered that I'm, I'm going to talk about how I consider them today. And on one hand, you have time. And on the other hand, you have space. Now, not to get too philosophical, but one of the joys and one of the difficulties of planting a garden throughout a growing season is you do have to consider both time and space. Um, so when we think about the timing, we're going to be thinking about things like when do I start seeds? If you're starting seeds in order to have seedlings at the appropriate height and stage of life to be planted out when it will most maximize their potential for harvesting in that season. Right. But you can also be thinking in terms of time of if you are going to purchase some seedlings, when do you buy them in order to stick them in the ground? So you're not going to either kill them or you're not going to stick them in so late that you're not going to get a harvest, right? So time is an important consideration. That's totally blanked on the word. The other part of time that I will touch on oh so briefly is this idea of succession planting, which is as the season goes on, you're going to have things that either you harvest out and just kind of are done and you're going to pull them out and you want to have your timing thought through enough that you can plunk new stuff in that space in order to maximize the time that you have in your garden. I am not in this video going to touch on, you know, season extenders or any of that sort of stuff. You can get into all that. I don't want to make this an, an hour long video. I really just want to kind of explore the basics of how to think through the timing in your garden. Now, on the other hand, of course, is that idea of space, that idea of what do you want to give the space to? in your garden. What makes sense for you? My garden has evolved a lot in terms of what I give space to. Um, and how much space do you give those things? Peas are lovely and easy to grow. And I think one of the best things in the world you can grow yourself. But if your family or you don't like peas, then don't give your space to peas. Seems logical. <laughs> Right. And of course those two things exist together. So as you're thinking about space, you're thinking about some stuff 
is going to, as the season progresses, you're going to pull it out and then you've got new space to think about in the middle or even towards the end of the season, right? So that's what we're doing today. I'm going to talk, like I said, kind of briefly about how I deal with those two things. I really want to empower those of you who are thinking about a garden for the first or second or even third time. Like you still feel like you're, you're pretty new at the situation. Yeah. So let me, let me do what? What am I doing? What am I doing, David? <laughs> he doesn't know friends. He never knows. Let me talk about my timing. Actually, no. I'm going to talk about my layout first. That's what I'm going to do. Cool. Now, in order to do that, I need to take you guys down from up there, put you up here in order to see what I'm doing. Cool? Cool. Welcome back. Welcome to my coffee table. Here's what I have going on in, the, in this space that I want to show you. And obviously, uh, everyone has different things. My laptop, which we will do later. My laptop is where I do a lot of my timing things. I will also link below some of the, the websites that I find super helpful when I'm thinking through garden spacing, which is what I'm talking about now, and also garden timing, which I will be talking about later. Very specifically, Johnny's Seeds has a rich, rich library of super useful resources. Just to show you guys what, what this is, because I actually really love this. This was an old book that was pretty well destroyed. Um, Elements of Geology. So it's actually given to me from one of my students. I used to teach geology. And so I use the old cover in order to hold all my little gardening journals in one place. And that's that's that. <laughs> I know that there are a lot of people who really enjoy journaling and, and notebooks and things. I, I am one of those people. So I had to share that today. These are the two that I'm, I'm most interested in sharing with you guys. This is, this actually is something that I should share. That's actually pretty helpful. This, this is actually where I live. <laughs> if you poke around the internet, you can absolutely find a map of your property. And so this one is my property line. And this is super, super helpful. I'm not going to get too in depth, but, but just as, as a resource to kind of keep in mind as you are planning a garden, this has contour lines, you know, lines of elevation to show you the general slope of where you live, it is different layers. You can toggle on and off. Some places have extensive soil maps. It's, um, it's actually a really interesting, cool thing. So anyway, I've got that in my gardening book. I've got a little folding pocket guide to species. I've got a list of invasive plants that I want to make sure I avoid. It's just a random conglomeration of <laughs> things. You might feel like you need a bigger spot than this in order to hold your things, which is totally valid. But those are the things that I find myself returning to more often than not. The other kind of researchy sort of informational thing that I have in here is this. It's got notes as I watch videos or as I read books or as I want to sit down with a cup of coffee and daydream like what we're going to do with the, the chickens from the fair a few years ago. Just little notes on the average monthly climate. Brainstorming. It's just, anyway, all sorts of things. Most notably right now, just flip it right here to the end. Every year as I go through all my seeds and put them in little boxes, which if you're interested in how I organize my seeds, which is not very well, my friends, not very well. <laughs> But if you're interested, drop me a comment and I can share that as I go through my seeds before I start ordering any for the year. Um, I write down this giant list of all the ones I have. And friends, let me just share. This is just my flowers. I haven't even done it for my veggies. It's a lot. Whether you are a new gardener or an old gardener who doesn't do this, I highly recommend 
that you do. It is one, it's, it's just, it brings me joy. It brings me joy to be a scribe. It's a place that like, I write down my, my daydreams. If I have like gone to a park and I see a plants that I want, and then I scribble them down in here. And if you can find one that is just like a beautiful little book, bonus points. Anyway, that was a lot. That was a lot on that. And that's not even the whole point. This is the guy that we're most interested in right now. So this, this is my spatial <laughs> garden planner. And by the way, I did not mention this in my little intro yammering. Um, this is very focused on the productive garden um, or what I call my productive garden. Everything that I'm talking about is completely and totally applicable to a garden that is more aesthetic, like you, your garden beds, or if you've got borders or things totally applicable, but I, everything I'm showing you is, is how I plan my productive gardening. Um, just if you're doing this in just kind of regular garden beds, instead of starting tomato seeds, you're going to be starting zinnia seeds, right? Right. So I doodle my garden layout every year, or I say doodle, I use dot grid notebook. I don't know how well you can see. And then I sketch out my beds. Um, this is my main, my main, all my raised beds, but then these are all my other little random extras and I draw them to scale, um, which I find super useful so that I can really kind of dial in where all of my individual plants are going to go. You can see, I know that things like sweet peppers need about 18 inches, if not maybe a little more worth of spacing. So I just put little circles where I'm going to put them based on my scale. I plant some things in blocks like this. I plant some things along the edges of my beds, like cucumbers, because I know that I've got these trellises that go up around there. And I plant some things in tiny little rows that go across my beds this way. And I plant some things in long rows, like these sunflowers that go all along my beds. And all of that is totally just thinking through what makes sense in terms of how I'm going to harvest it, what makes sense in terms of how many I want and maximizing the space that I have to be able to get as much stuff. So my lettuces, I don't, they don't need a ton of space. So they're happy to go this way. Um, my snaps like to be in a block because I like to net those, which is another consideration. So that's roughly how I do it. The other part of what I do is here's like my initial sort of sketchy thoughts, but I also at the end of the season went through and drew just how it ended up. Okay guys, um, I know you're not gonna be able to tell super easily what I'm writing, especially since I'm scribbling pretty quickly, but let me tell you what I'm thinking about as I write this down, or as I, as I sort of sketch out my plan. First of all, I am thinking that this is not gonna be set in stone. I am also thinking a little bit about crop rotation, if it's easy. I'm going to avoid keeping things in the same positions as they were last year. And crop rotation is a valid thing to think about because you might have diseases that have become resident in a soil that might affect, say, brassicas, but they won't affect, say, nightshades. The other reason why I like to think about crop rotation is because different things pull different nutrients out of the soil. And you don't want a soil to be depleted in certain things, but still be perfectly fine for other crops. And so you move stuff around. That being said, if you've got good, healthy soil, you've used maybe some cover crops, you, you bring in some new compost every year, you don't have to be as stressed about it. And I am not militant about it at all. The other thing I'm thinking about is which direction is south and which direction is north. I put the things that love the sun, mostly to kind of the southwest of my garden. So I'm going to think about moving things to the south sides of the beds that want a little bit more sun um, and not planting tall things that are going to shade them out. But also things like snapdragons that like it cooler, things like carrots that like it a little bit cooler. Those things I'm happy to put 
kind of on the north end of my bed. So I'm thinking about that too. And again, sort of thinking about spacing. Things like zinnias need a little bit more space than things like celosias. You can pack a lot of celosias in together. Snapdragons you can pack in pretty tightly together. Peppers need a little bit more space. Finally, in my garden, I'm thinking about trellising because things like tomatoes, things like peas, and things like my dahlias all require some sort of support. My garden already has some infrastructure in it that we just leave up. So I know that my tomatoes don't have a whole lot of beds they can go in to already have an infrastructure up. Same thing with peas and things, same thing with dahlias. And again, I won't go into details because that's it, it might be different for you. I also have three beds that have hoop coverings. And so I know I said I wasn't going to get too much into extending seasons, but I am going to be thinking about putting some crops in to those beds that can go into the frost. Things like some lettuces and spinach and things and things that if we get a good solid freeze, I could cover up if I needed to. So I'll put those sorts of things in those beds that um that might take them into the fall so yeah that is that is a really quick glimpse into what my brain is doing as i'm jotting these things down and again knowing that it's it's gonna change it's definitely gonna change okay i spent some time <laughs> talking about layout hopefully that all made sense hopefully i wasn't too rambly that was yesterday becky that's why i'm in different clothes um, today, Becky is going to talk about timing and how I plan that bit, which is equally, if not more important than layout in a lot of ways. So as I mentioned yesterday, yesterday, Becky, I don't even remember everything she said. I'm sure it was wise. You should listen to her. Again, we're exploring this idea that a garden exists in time and space. So we talk about space and there's a lot, I, frankly, space, I think, is a little bit more fun because you're mentally walking through a garden. And what are you going to see when you look over here? And what are you going to see when you look over here, etc. Timing is a little bit harder for us to wrap our heads around. It's a little bit more ephemeral. If, no, that's not the word I'm on a lot. It's not as tangible. So it's a little more difficult. So here's how I start to wrap my head around it. Um, I am, as I'm talking to you guys there, here, <laughs> I'm also playing with my computer here. So in order to wrap my head around this whole time thing, I've created a spreadsheet, which I know, I'm such a geek. <laughs> I have tried a couple different planting apps I've tried a couple different ways to doodle things. I simply just keep this, which always comes in the back of my Southern Exposure Seed Catalog that just has planting dates for veggies. And But as, as my garden has grown, as I've done, that's probably obnoxious. <laughs> I have more flowers. And as I've been trying to be very intentional about maximizing not only space, which is easy to wrap my head around, but also maximizing my time, it got too complicated. So I made a spreadsheet. There are programs out there. Um, I have not used any of them with any success, so I can't recommend any of them, but absolutely there, is, there are garden planning softwares out there that you pay for, and validly so. It can be a good bit of work <laughs> to do this, but let me show you what I've done. You can do this by hand if you don't have quite as many things you're growing as me. The ideology remains the same, no matter if you're using a program that you buy, a spreadsheet that you create, or a just pen and paper system. It's the same idea. I'm gonna try not to geek out too much about my, <laughs> my spreadsheet because I don't think it'll be that fascinating. If any of you would like kind of maybe a dedicated tutorial on how I've used just Excel in order to create this monstrosity. Um, I'm not an expert 
by the way. I'm sure someone else could do it better. But if you're interested, I don't know, let me know. Let me know. Okay, so let me let me show you. So I'm casting my screen right now. Maybe I'll make myself a little bubble down here in the bottom of the screen. Be like, hi guys, this is me. Okay, what this is, is my year. So we've got um, my months up here, January through November. That's exciting. And each one is broken down into the weeks. And this is kind of rough um, and, and it's okay. But basically like right now we're in the fourth week of January or by the time I put this up, it might be the first week of February. And so we're looking right now at like this column. Okay, so so there's that. I have put in the leftmost column all of the things I am growing and I have even gone so far as to create different tabs for my veggies and such. But really the heart of this is this first tab and really, really what I needed to wrap my head around the most in my case were the flowers. I find it much easier to wrap my heart, my head around veggies because the reality is in my garden right now, I don't grow as many veggies as I do flowers. Flowers are a little bit trickier. You will notice, and you might have noticed as I hover over these, I'm a little extra. <laughs> and the varieties that I filled my left column with, I also have links to, um, the appropriate page on Johnny's. And I won't show you any more about that, but that's just because very little of this information resides in my brain. And so Johnny's website is one of the absolute best resources. I mentioned that earlier of finding a days to germination, days to maturity, how frost hardy these are, etc., etc. Cause all that's going to be important. So here are the, here are the takeaways for this calendar. And again, no matter whether or not you're doing this by hand or on another program, the key dates that you will want to know are on my little calendar highlighted in green and highlighted in red. Um, so here's right here for me, I have about the fourth week of April, third or fourth week of April. Um, on mine is highlighted green and then about the third week in October is highlighted red. And those are my potential first frost and my potential last frost. So first frost and last frost. Um, by the way, if you don't know those, just Google it, put in your zip code and say date of last frost. And I go by a pretty good chance that I'm still going to get a frost. If there's a pretty good chance that I'm still going to get a frost, I'm not planning out anything that is tender. And all that information again is going to be on seed packets or Google it. For instance, peppers cannot deal with a frost at all. <laughs> they do not leave my greenhouse. As you see here, they are not going to leave my greenhouse until at absolute earliest the last week of April. But again, I, I don't want there to be any possibility. So I usually buffer it by a couple weeks. Likewise, things like sunflowers cannot tolerate a frost. So when I'm looking at this, I'm going to make sure that they have matured before my first frost rolls around, probably going to be sometime in mid October and frosts guys. That's, when it comes to timing that it's always going to be a gamble and you can always decide how much do you want to push it. I often end up throwing a couple sunflower seeds out a little later than I should on the chance that we're going to get a frost much later in the season. And I've got a couple extra weeks to allow them to mature because sunflowers in October are some of my favorites. So for me, my pretty safe time is going to be the end of April and all the way through the middle of October. So that's what we consider our growing season. And so on the backs of seed packets or 
on websites, you are able to find how early to start those seeds in order to have them ready to put out when it is appropriate. Let's look at zinnias. So here are my zinnias. I'm going to just put a little boxer in them so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. Um, I actually have more varieties than this, but it, it gives you an idea. I actually haven't updated this completely for the new season. It's going to tell me on the seed packet, it's going to tell me to start zinnias anywhere between four and six weeks inside before it's time to transplant outside. So you can see um, the zinnias are, are like I'm, I'm going to risk it a little bit with zinnias. So as you can see on my little chart, I am going to transplant them. That's what the TR1 stands for. I'm going to transplant them out that week that it's still kind of possible to get a frost. I'm going to keep an eye on the weather forecast, which means I just count back four weeks and SS1 on my little thing means that's when I'm starting those seeds in, in my case, in my greenhouse. Other people's case might be inside. And so I'm going to start four, all four of these varieties, start a couple trays, planning on planting out towards the end of April. Now you'll notice that that transplant date, I only gave myself four weeks for my seedlings, which means that I've got a two week buffer before they're really going to start struggling within their cell packs because I could go as long as six weeks to, to, to transplant them out. Now notice the other thing that I have with my zinnias, because again, I'm thinking about when I'm going to transplant them out so to start some blooms nice and early, but I'm also going to think about the fact that zinnias are not going to last the whole season in my garden, at least not well. We have hot, very humid summers, which means that they are pretty prone to um, mildew in my area. They tend to get sick. They tend to start to peter out. And so sometime in May, I'm also going to direct seed some and they're going to get going. And then if I keep on looking through time, sometime in mid June is when I'm going to, I'm thinking forward to harvesting those seeds that I started in March. And then sometime at the end of July, I'm probably going to be able to harvest some of those ones that I direct seeded in May and maybe I'm going to start pulling out some of those earlier plants that have gotten mildew by then. I hope that's clear and actually what I didn't mention the convention on my little spreadsheet if it's green it means I'm either seeding or planting if it's yellow it means I'm harvesting and again let me say this timeline is totally based on how my, my days to germination whether or not these plants are frost hardy and then the days to maturity, the days to harvest. Um, of course, zinnias are something are some things that are cut and come again. So even though it says I'm harvesting in the middle of June, I know and I could put this on here, but I just know that that means that I'm going to be continuously harvesting from these plants all the way through until the plants just sort of give out. Another example of things. Let me go down to kind of my more general flowers just to go through a couple of them. Yarrow, my Colorado mix. I winter sowed that actually just last week. Um, so that's where I put the WS and um, about the middle towards the end of January. I'm also going to be starting some seeds and trays towards the end of March, giving myself about eight weeks until I'm looking at transplanting them out, especially yarrow is a little more frost, frost hardy because it is a perennial. Um, so I'm going to start some towards the end of February, and then I'm going to be looking at transplanting the ones that I either winter sowed or started in my greenhouse. Again, as soon as the frost free time hits towards the end of April, I'm also going to try to direct sow some that happens with a lot of them. And then I'm going to be looking for yarrow for it to be blooming towards the end of June, maybe even into early July. But of course, with yarrow, again, that's a cut and come again. I'm going to be harvesting from that first bunch for a while. And then the ones I direct sowed are probably going to be coming into bloom towards the end of August um, and will keep on giving me blooms until the frost 
Likewise, let's go down to um, a viola, which is a good one because that one is a very frost hardy little plant. So I'm going to start those seeds um, now, <laughs> actually, the end of January. And then I'm going to be able to stick them out towards the end of March, early April, like Easter time, which is so much fun. Um, they can totally handle a frost. They can handle a full on freezing snow atop their heads. I never understood why pansies are the flowers of choice when it comes to calling somebody weak because they're tough little cookies. Let me go down. I'm going to skip down to something that, ah, my sunflowers. Let me talk about those. Oh, so briefly, um, because everything else that I had mentioned so far is, is a cut and come again. Um, but my sunflowers are, are not, <laughs> they are a one hit wonder. So I'm actually only going to really start one variety in seed trays. They much prefer to be direct sowed if you can get away with it. And I'll be honest, I just take a loss on some of my seeds because I have so many squirrels and rabbits that like to eat the seeds and the little tiny baby seedlings. And it's kind of heartbreaking, but there's so many other good things that I, I tend to still get the majority of my sunflowers make it through. Um, so you can see in this little calendar here, I direct seed most of them. And you can also see, hopefully, that my sunflowers are staggered all throughout the growing season because they are a one hit wonder. Once I cut off their heads, they're kind of done, except for um, Jade is a, is a branching variety. So I will get multiple cuts off of him and he's actually the one that this year I'm thinking about just starting from starting in a tray. You'll also notice like I think through um, I'm direct seeding some of the varieties that are more classic sunflowers earlier on in the season to get you know those beautiful yellow or orange blooms in July and August and then I'm direct seeding a nice a nice orange variety plum which is plum colored obviously so that's really great in the fall um and Moulin Rouge is a red. And so that's really great in the fall. Um, and I'm going to plant direct seed those. Hopefully I'm going to be getting a harvest before the frost, but you can see it's going to be tight. And if I get an early frost, I'm going to lose that crop. Um, so that's how I think about timing. I hope, I hope that wasn't too all over the place. Um, I hope that made sense. So again, when you're thinking about the timing of your crops, the most important thing to get in your head is, is your, your bookends of your season, that first frost date and that last frost date, totally available online. Go look it up. And then from there, know which varieties you have that are frost tender and which varieties are not. Um, now, when it comes to my veggies, um, I do a very similar thing to the flowers that I just showed you. I am going to be starting my tomatoes um, actually here relatively soon. They require 10 to 12 weeks or not require, but they can use 10 to 12 weeks before it's time to plant out. In my heat lovers, my tomatoes and my peppers and such, I'm actually not going to put in the garden until well after the potential last frost. Around here, we often say Mother's Day is kind of our, you're totally safe day. Um, so about the second week of May. Here's what I want to encourage you to think about too, as you're planning out your garden, something that I didn't always get my head around. And even as I sit here and tell you how early I'm going to be starting some of these seeds, I don't want that necessarily to instill in you this, um, sense of urgency because that's not really a thing. Things like, again, peppers and tomatoes, even though they require a pretty long growing season, you've, you've got time. And if you try and push that, which I always encourage you to try and push things, but there are some things that are simply going to struggle if you try and start them too early and try and grow them out of the season in which they want to grow. I have absolutely found that 
I can put out peppers a little early and they will sit and sulk in the cool soil. And the ones that I start three, four weeks later and set out later, by the end of the season, they have caught up and there is no noticeable difference in the harvest. I guess the take home message of that is you probably have more time than you think. Give it a go regardless and, and start to develop your own experiences and your own rules for what works in your garden. And don't stress, don't stress about it. Mother nature has done just fine. I know that was kind of a whirlwind. I know that I could speak a whole lot more. There's a lot of, of a lot. <laughs> There's quite a lot more that could be said on the subject of thinking through your garden plan. But um, if that was helpful or inspiring, let me know. And I'm always up for talking about planning out the garden. It's one of my favorite things in the world. Hopefully you guys are safe and warm wherever you are and hopefully you are enjoying this um, sort of slower time in order to plan your gardens. By all means, share what you're growing and what you're excited about and um, any tips and tricks you might share with others in terms of what they can do to maximize their time and space in the garden. See you guys. Mary Duck Brandy Book. It's a pretty book. It's a pretty book.